floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Pakistan delegation aligns itself with the statement delivered by the distinguished representative of Iran on behalf of the non-aligned movement. We also thank the Secretary General for his report entitled, and I quote, Strengthening and Coordinating United Nations Rule of Law Activities, unquote, contained in document A-79-117. stroke stroke Mr. Chairman, today we are witnessing before our eyes the destruction of the rule of law at the international level, especially in the genocidal war which Israel has imposed on the people of Palestine and the Middle East. We are witnessing this also in the violations of international humanitarian law, in the dismantling of the treaties for arms control and disarmament, in the massive violations of human rights of peoples under foreign occupation, in the violence and discrimination against religious and ethnic minorities, in targeted assassinations in third countries. And yet, some countries complicit in this erosion of international law continue to advocate adherence to this rule of law, but only as they interpret and apply it. Mr. Chairman, this committee must make its important contribution to restoring world order by classifying and clarifying what is or is not law as mentioned in the phrase rule of law. What is the relationship between national and international law and whether the applicable laws are being applied and observed or are being violated. Firstly, the laws which form the body of the rule of law include most prominently the UN Charter, especially its basic principles such as the right to self-determination, the sovereignty of states and their territorial integrity, non-use or threat of use of force, non-interference in internal affairs, non-acquisition of territory by the use of force. It is a disturbing indication of our current state of affairs, Mr. Chairman, that the reflection of these basic principles in the Pact of the Future adopted at the summit last month were, was opposed by some member states and some prominent groups and do not figure in the text of this pact. Besides the Charter, the rule of law includes international treaties such as the Geneva Conventions international disarmament treaties, and human rights convention. Next, under the UN Charter, especially Article 25 of the Charter, all member states are legally obliged to implement the decisions of the Security Council, which means that the Security Council's resolutions, whether a adopted under Chapter 6 or Chapter 7 are binding and must be implemented. Solemn international declarations adopted by the UN General Assembly with wide support from member states, for example, the Declaration on Decolonization and the Declaration on Friendly Relations Among States, 
and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights have all acquired the status of international common law and must be observed. The interpretive and explanatory work of the International Court of Justice through its case law and advisory opinions also constitute the corpus of the laws that are part of the rule of law. However, Mr. Chairman, what is not part of the rule of law are norms and laws adopted in restrictive and non-inclusive forums and those formulated by non-governmental forums. A prime example of such non-inclusive norms is the restrictive, discriminatory and oligopolic arms control regimes like the MTCR, the Australia Group, the Wessenauer Arrangement, and similar restricted groups which seek to impose norms devised by themselves globally and without the consent of other states. Similarly, norms evolved in restricted and often non-official forums cannot be imposed internationally. Their incorporation in Chapter 7 resolutions of the Security Council is an unacceptable method of creating international legal obligations on all member states. International laws must be adopted in inclusive forums where all member states have the opportunity to participate on an equal footing such as UNCLOS and the recently adopted BBNJ Treaty, which are good examples. Pakistan therefore welcomes the invitation in Resolution 8-78-112 stroke stroke for a discussion on the subtopic, and I quote, the full, equal, and equitable participation at all levels in the international legal systems. Mr. Chairman, often Calls are made on states to implement the rule of law at the national level, including restrictively adopted norms and laws. There is need for clarity on this point. Certainly, all member states are obliged to observe and apply, besides their own constitutional and national laws, established international law, especially the provisions of the Charter, resolutions of the Security Council, and international treaties to which they are a party. They should also observe what has emerged as international common law. However, states are not obliged to observe treaties to which they are not a party, nor norms evolved in restrictive bodies, and certainly not the national laws of other, even if they are powerful states. The use of international coercive measures by some states to impose their national laws, norms, and demands on other states constitute clear violations of the rule of law. Mr. Chairman, this presentation is, of course, not an extensive analysis. But our purpose is to clarify the parameters of what is often loosely termed as the rule of law. This legal committee can make a singular contribution by assigning the International Law Commission to work on such a clarification and perhaps also seek an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on what exactly constitutes the rule of law. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the distinguished permanent representative of Pakistan for his statement. I now give the floor to the